art in three mediums, painting, film, and photo. Three mediums as well as three countries. So let me introduce our panelists, who you all know. Professor Vanessa Rocco is Associate Professor of Humanities and Fine Arts at Southern New Hampshire University, Manchester, and former Associate Curator at the International Center of Photography in New York. Her latest book, Photo Fascism, published by Bloomsbury Academic, which is a great book, was supported in part by a Getty Research Institute library grant. She is also co-editor with Elizabeth Otto of the New Woman International Representations in Photography and Film from the 1870s to the 1960s, published by University of Michigan Press, 2011-2012. John McCannon is professor of history of Su uh, professor of history at Southern New Hampshire University with research specialties in Russia and Eastern Europe. He writes about Russian art and culture and also in the history of exploration. His earlier publications include Red Arctic, Polar Exploration, and The Myth of the North in the Soviet Union with Oxford University Press, and a history of the Arctic, nature, exploration, and exploitation with Raytheon Books and the University of Chicago Press. So now we're going to turn it over with John is going to give a presentation of his book first, which I neglected to say hasn't been published yet, but I did get an opportunity to read the introduction. Which bribe you all to get some of you here. Uh, it's nice to see you. So um, of our two subjects tonight, uh, I clearly had the lesser known one uh, compared to fascist and Mussolini and Hitler. Although I would also say I may actually arguably have the more eye-popping uh, subject as well. Um, but one of the first things I like to say about Rarick, uh, the subject of my book, is that uh, even if you have never heard of him, you actually know more about him than you think. Uh, because the story has almost as much to do with America as it does with Russia. And he knew so many people, and he uh, influenced or affected so many things that you do know about, and we'll cover some of those things, I think, as we go along. Rarick had an immensely uh, complex career as an artist, an explorer, a peace activist, but also as a New Age occultist and quite possibly a spy. So even though our common point of uh, discussion tonight uh, is going to be the political uses of art uh, during the interwar period, um, I think in Rarick's case, at least some biographical overview is a useful way to start. So I'm going to go ahead and take that approach. Um, if I have time left over near the end of this spiel, I'll talk about some of the political messages that might intersect with Vanessa's. If not, we might have that come up during the uh, overall discussion and our question and answer. So uh, Nicholas Rarick, whom you see here, a uh, cheerful fellow, uh, as you can uh, tell from this picture, uh, was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1874, and he lived until 1947 when he died in Northwest India. And his career is divided really into two distinct periods, before and after the Russian revolutions of 1917. And he was well known during both halves, the halves of his career, although for very different reasons. As an artist in Russia, uh, Rarick began his career just before 1900, um, and this is his graduation painting from the uh, Russian Academy of Art in St. Petersburg uh, in 1897. And he quickly became his generation's acknowledged expert in painting scenes from ancient Slavic history. That became his big specialty. Uh, and here's a uh, kind of a sample of some of the scenes he painted in the early 1900s that give you a sense of his pre-revolutionary work. Uh, he was interested in prehistoric Stone Age Russia and medieval Russia. 
Um, this painting is actually in every Russian K through 12 history textbook, depicting uh, kind of like the, the, the earliest periods of Russian history. And this is, is about as famous as George Washington crossing the Delaware would be to us as kind of just sort of a picture of old history uh, that you would learn about in your classrooms. Here are a couple of other paintings. I'm just going to run through these. We'll talk about them later, uh, maybe, to give you a sense of his style in the early stages of his career. Uh, again, deep interest in these older parts of Russian history. Um, and I will note that in these paintings, there is a political reaction against the modern era uh, that's being conveyed in these paintings. And I think we'll talk more about that later. Uh, kind of nostalgia for the past is one of these messages that may dovetail with some of the discussion we have about presentation of political ideologies in the present, or in, at least in the interwar period. Now, before 1917, Rarick became an enormously influential teacher of art in Russia. He ran one of the largest schools of art, his, uh, of, of painting in Russia. One of his students was Mark Chagall, although that was not one of the, not really a terribly happy relationship. And he gained international fame as a set and costume designer for operas and ballets. Um, here he worked with uh, Sergei Diaghilev's renowned Ballet Russe in Paris. Uh, this is really the group that popularized Russian ballet as an art form in the larger world. And it was with this group that he created his most famous works for the stage. Here, for the Orientalist opera Prince Igor, uh, talking about a kind of a military clash between Russians and Asiatic peoples from the East. And also for the monumentally groundbreaking ballet, The Rite of Spring, which he co-created with Igor Stravinsky. And uh, the Paris premiere of the Rite of Spring in 1913 is one of the hallmark moments of the birth of our artistic modernity in Europe. So here's one set design. Uh, this is another. And the whole backdrop of the Rite of Spring is about kind of the primeval nature of ancient Slavdom. Although if you've ever watched Fantasia, the Disney picture, I don't know, that, that, that may be aging ourselves here a little bit, but that's the dinosaur scene in Fantasia, which both Stravinsky and Rarick thought was an imbecile treatment of the thing that they worked yeah, on so hard. Born, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> but I, my daughter has seen it, but I don't know about y'all. In any case, um, I will note that um, Rarick was a lifelong peace activist as well. Um, and uh, he was interested in promoting, uh, protecting art and architecture in times of war. So he ended up earning several nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he had a long-term influence on the Hague and UNESCO conventions that still attempt to safeguard art in, uh, in conditions of art and conflict. Uh, and he had a lot of influence on the US government's sponsorship of that kind of thing in the 1930s. Now, I would say that alone, would be enough to justify a biography. But there is more. While still in Russia, Rarick, uh, guided by his wife, Yelena, who you see here on his right, uh, became increasingly attracted to various forms of alternative spirituality, including seances, uh, various forms of Eastern philosophy, including Tibetan Buddhism, and theosophy, which is kind of the incubator of most of the modern New Age movements that are popular today. Now, dabbling in the occult was not really unusual among artists and intellectuals in the early 1900s. Uh, if I were to give you a list of the cultural celebrities in Russia and Europe who did that, you might be surprised to hear all the names that would appear on that list. Um, but in any case, not only did the Rarics become really serious practitioners of the occult, they founded their own occult school, uh, which still exists today in Russia, America, and India, and is a fairly serious thing. Uh, which, by the way, colors a lot of the way Rarick gets written about by other people uh, and uh, kind of an interesting tangle if you want to take a scholarly approach to him. Now, the extravagance of the Rarick's occultism has a lot to do with how the family reacted to World War I and the revolutions that struck Russia in 1917. Uh, because to the Rarick's, uh, Russia's defeat in the war and the communist revolutions of 1917 felt like nothing less than literal apocalypse. And this is a pre-World War I painting that kind of gives a sense of Rarick's sense of impending doom in the 1910s. Uh, the Rarick family fled Russia as refugees after the communist revolution. They went to Finland, then England, and then to New York City, uh, which they reached by 1920. And in America, they attracted a circle of followers who were both rich and conveniently gullible. Uh, and uh, basically, this, the circle of supporters ended up uh, supporting Rarick's activities for the next decade plus. 
Um, they built for him over here. This is actually a building you can still see today on the Upper West Side of New York. Uh, this was the master building that housed a museum for Rarick, an art school that he ran, and it was kind of the official or the unofficial headquarters for all of his activities, both public and, as we'll see in a second, not so public. Um, and this is where things get interesting. While in the States, on one hand, openly and famously, Rarick continued his art and his peace activism. Um, with his son, Yuri, who is an accomplished scholar of Asian languages, Rarick and his family went on a massive expedition uh, in the 1920s to the Himalayas, Tibet, and Central Asia. And then Rarick returned with his son to Asia in the mid-1930s, sponsored by the US federal government. So he basically was this explorer painting and, as he said in public, doing archaeology and anthropology uh, in the wilds of East and Central Asia. And he featured regularly in the New York Times and the American press. He gained the admiration and even sometimes friendship of figures like H.G. Wells, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, if you're into horror fiction, one of his biggest fans was H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, Albert Einstein, the mythologist Joseph Campbell, all these people really, really were attracted to Rarick during the 1920s and 30s. Um, and he also was a big uh, uh, magnet for figures in the Indian independence movement, and this had a lot to do with his occult interest. And uh, key figures like Jawaharlal Nehru, who became the first prime minister of India after independence, was a really close friend with him in Rarick's older age. So immensely well-connected uh, in these really, really fascinating ways during the 20s and 30s. One fan I want to emphasize in particular um, is Henry Wallace, uh, a key figure from American history from the Roosevelt era. He served as Roosevelt's, uh, in Roosevelt's cabinet as the agriculture secretary and world and vice president during most of World War II. Uh, and then he ran for president in 1948. Why would I mention uh, Henry Wallace? because not only was he an admirer of Rarick, he was a Rarick follower for about seven years, totally in Rarick's inner circle, totally immersed in his occult beliefs, and the person who actually sponsored Rarick's second expedition to Asia in 1934, 1935. Um, so he was all in for Rarick for over half a decade, both spiritually and politically. And by the way, I know we live in a cashless economy these days, but the next time you pull a dollar bill out of your pocket, uh, and we all know that the great seal of the United States is part of the dollar bill. Now, that's been a symbol, the eye in the pyramid, uh, ever since the 1700s. It's, 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 it's not an unusual symbol in American iconography. Um, however, it was not on the dollar bill until the currency reforms under Roosevelt until 1932. And when the Roosevelt administration actually redesigned the dollar bill, the person whose idea was to put this on our currency was Henry Wallace's, and he did so on the suggestion of guess who. So uh, actually, you think about my artist the next time you actually pull some cash out of your pocket. Um, so Hollywoodized version of Shangri-La, if you've ever heard that term. Um, it's also linked with this, uh, this long-standing myth. So, does this sound crazy? I, I hope we all agree that it does. Frank, because if you're attracted to this idea, then there's something maybe a little bit wrong with you. But in any case, um, what is astounding, though, is that there were other schemes like this, kind of state-building schemes that involved trying to manipulate or co-opt native uh, or Asian indigenous myths.
convinced to take these plans seriously, at least briefly, and even to support them, at least for a while. Um, this includes Buddhist clergy in Asia, some people who are highly Grace, who had left the Soviet Union. And of course, actually, Henry Wallace in Franklin Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, and R Wallace was fully in cahoots with this kind of plan until he finally snapped out of this delusion in 1935. Um, now, a final astounding thing about Rarick's plan was that uh, politically it was equal opportunity when it came to left versus right. Um, and we can talk more about his, the, the political labels that attach to Rarick later or his political outlook. I'll just say that left versus right mattered less to him than whatever got him moving closer to his spiritual and geopolitical ideals. Uh, there's kind of a pendulum shift, which is very confusing to follow and uh, makes it very hard to study his life story. When he left Russia, he was anti-Soviet. Then in the middle of the 20s, after Lenin had died, he became pro-Soviet. So his first trip to Asia was actually involved a covert scheme to work with the Soviets to build this state. That failed. He turned again to the right and became anti-Soviet. That was his 1930s expedition. When that failed, he went back finally near the end of his life to becoming anti-Soviet, I'm sorry, pro-Soviet. Um, and um, this, this pendulum motion kind of, A, makes them confusing, but B, in the present day has mean that present day Russians you can be a fan of Rarick, regardless of whether you're a liberal, conservative, left, right, or in between, because he left behind footprints all over the political landscape. OK, um, just to wrap up the story, because I don't want to intrude too much on uh, Vanessa's time, um, I'm sure you will be shocked to hear that all these geopolitical plans crashed and burned, especially in 1935 when uh, the back and forth caught up with him. His American followers turned on him, including Henry Wallace. Now, uh, Rarick did end up uh, moving to India and staying there for the rest of his life. And I'll note, his memory is very cherished there. He's an honorary citizen. Uh, his, his legacy in India uh, is very secure, and it's one of the countries that admires him the most. Um, he did spend the last years of his life painting in a very different style than he had before. Uh, and he, I'm just going to give you a quick sample of his later works to give you a sense of the Asiatic and the mystical themes and the mountainscapes that he painted, which basically make up a very different second stage body of work. So you can get a sense of the rather dramatic paintings that I will say art historians in the West are not fond of, but uh, art historians in Russia love. And I will note, Russians themselves, I've been to museums watching like middle school field trips, uh, and they're like bored out of their skulls going through the major museums in Russia. Then they come to the rare room, they're like, oh, this is so cool. Um, so um, kind of a split uh, sense of the art that he publishes later on in his life. Um, the mountainscapes, I will note that most Russians love these to bits, and people in India do as well. Um, last thing I'll say about him, because I want to wrap up. Um, he lives kind of a life of kind of marginalization in India, you know, certainly cut off from the American world he'd been such a part of. I will note that because Henry Wallace, vice president under Roosevelt, had had the bad judgment to actually leave behind in writing lots of letters indicating how much he loved Rarick and how much he'd been involved with his schemes until 1935, Rarick completely inadvertently had an influence on not one but three presidential elections here in the States. The 1940 election, there's a lot of behind the scenes Rarick mess. 1944 election, Henry Wallace is removed as vice president in favor of Henry Truman because of his connections with Rarick. And when Henry Wallace uh, ran for president in 1948, finally what were known as the Dear Guru letters that he left behind from the 1920s and 1930s finally were published. And this totally shifted the 1948 campaign. And if you know this picture from US history, Harry Truman narrowly squeaked out his victory over the Republican. The thing is, Henry Wallace is running as a third party candidate. And if not for Rarick, he would almost certainly have stolen enough votes from Truman that that newspaper headline would have been real. Uh, so in any case, lots of story to unpack. Um, I will note, just in terms of political things, um, Rarick's occultism caused him to, I think, wander into political directions that I don't want to say are fascist uh, or necessarily right wing or what have you. They caused him to put a lot of premium on hierarchy 
which is, of course, the hallmark of this kind of political ideology. And nostalgia for the past is a reaction to the uh, kind of alienation uh, and depersonalization of the modern world. Now, that's an impulse that crosses a lot of political boundaries, but I think nostalgia for the past, the nostalgia for kind of a lost country or a lost civilization uh, that you want to recover is also one of the hallmarks of fascist thought. And um, I think that kind of is one of the things where our kind of uh, our, our treatments of the intersection between art and culture during the 1920s and 30s uh, kind of brings our books kind of closer together, even though fascist photos are not Tibetan Buddhist photos, but still, uh, I think there's, there, there's some intersection we can explore a little bit later on. So uh, let me wrap up. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to go ahead and turn things straight over to Vanessa. So I think I'm going to use the one on the screen. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, where's your oh, one second. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. So I think that, yeah, as uh, John sort of alluded to, I think that um, some of the powerful crossovers between his work and mine have to do um, with uh, religion and also a cult of personality. So the, you know, the real goal of my book is to show how these dictators, uh, specifically Mussolini and Hitler kind of following in his footsteps, managed to manufacture consent amongst the publics. It's important to remember that in the 1930s, the goal of the dictators was not um, pure coercion, but rather to get as much buy-in to their policies as possible, soften the public up, Get as you know, get as much support as they could before they actually resorted to coercive uh, measures, and a lot of that had to do with creating um, an irresistible cult of personality, but also tinged with religion. Um, so, for example, Mussolini was the first real mass media uh, dictator of the 20th century. He um, you know, was an absolute master at um, using newly powerful mass media outlets uh, like weekly illustrated magazines, uh, like film and photography, um, in order to embed his cult of personality in the public. So it was just one example of this man who's you know, not being a shrinking violet is the fact that uh, the exhibition, which is one of the main focuses of my book, it was a 1932 uh, show, exhibition about the 10 year anniversary of him coming into power, had this image of him sculpted out of stone on the cover with in the background, Duce, Duce, Duce written, uh, and that's basically leader, but in such a way that you know he could imagine people picking this book up and singing it to themselves. And this catalog actually, uh, this very version of the catalog was purchased happily for me by the library, thank you, um, and has an inscription in it that it was actually found in the belongings of Italian soldiers who were fighting in World War II. So they carried this around with them um, to the front. So <clears throat> Mussolini was right off the bat, when he came into power in 1922, was obsessed with using weekly illustrated magazines to um, you know, sort of spread his vision of his Italian regime throughout the public. He had a propensity in particular towards these oceanic views of masses attending his rallies. And so this is a spread from one of the state-sponsored magazines, Revista Illustrata. And interestingly, so it shows a double-page spread of various crowds amassing for his rallies. And I think two interesting things pop out of these. First of all, he is not featuring himself in these. He's featuring the crowds. And he's also making sure to always, you know, drop in wherever possible, just to point this out, architectural structures so that the people who are amassing 
feel connected to Italy's great past. So initially, there was a real propensity towards using weekly illustrated magazines with these lavish illustrations. But the fascists concurrently realized how much they could use um, exhibition spaces to their benefit um, for, you know, obviously collective gatherings of large numbers of people, but also they were very useful vehicles for rewriting history. So this 1932 exhibition was, again, on the 10-year anniversary of him uh, rising to power, but it gave him a chance to rewrite history, make him look much more like the conquering hero, when if, in fact, he came to power in 1922 as a result of, you know, a back room deal, you know, cigar-filled rooms, or smoke-filled rooms is like sort of the cliche now that we hear, a deal with the Italian king for him to legally rise to a leadership position um, in the Italian government. So the exhibition gave him a chance to rewrite that history through mass media. One of the other really clever things that they did, um, the fascists, was to send a call out to the public for the public to contribute artifacts to this large-scale exhibition. So the people donated their uh, draft call-out posters from World War II, because the show was really supposed to be about the years between World War, I'm sorry, World War I, 1914 to 1922, years of the exhibition being celebrated on the 10-year anniversary of him rising to power. So people were uh, donating their, their draft uh, call-out posters, their artifacts, their newspaper articles, their portraits of family members who died in the war. So in other words, the people felt like this was their exhibition because of the call out. However, so there's a feeling of, you know, of grassroots, bottom up enfranchisement in both the experience and also of the government. However, this was a, a completely top-down enterprise. And the fascists were very forthcoming about this in the exhibition catalog where they talked about, my students have heard this before, they talk about how important it was to take all of this documentary material, which had the veneer of, of fact about it, and fit them into grandiose architectural structures that would make the public feel very specific feelings about the regime, pre-planned feelings about the regime. So the people feel like it's theirs, but actually the fascists are choreographing this through the combination of mass media images and architectural structures. So this is actually an image of Mussolini being donated the raw materials for. He, you know, he can be guided through here. And then uh, he was able to, the fascists were able to recruit actually some of the most high profile architects to be engaged in putting together these theatrical over the top rooms that were packed to the gills with documentary images that were blown up. So photo blow ups had reached a new level of technology at that time, they took advantage of that. Um, and so you get, for example, you know, rally scenes with the architecture that Mussolini always wanted um, there, so the people are reminded of great historical Rome, and then oceanic mass, uh, mass images, but plastered onto these grandiose structures that were pre-planned. And what you can see over here is that there's actually this uh, huge profile made out of um, iron, or steel, rather, of Mussolini's profile. So he's overlooking um, everyone who's walking through this exhibition. And so, again, to sort of see how messages were purposefully embedded, but in ways that people felt that they were coming to them on their own, this kind of ruse of the show be belonging to the people. So, these enormous images of crowds then plastered onto these 
airplane turbines, you know, which has this sort of undercurrent of violence to it, then a letter written in Mussolini's hand where he's quoting an historical Italian figure saying, those who oil the wheels of motion with their blood do so for the glory of the homeland. So he's, what he's doing is getting people ready, the people ready for war, to fight his war, that they are going to sacrifice themselves for, but they are going to feel like they have been brought to that through their own feelings of nationalism, right? It's kind of the ultimate manipulation of the dictator. So after they go through this, so this room is room A. I'm only showing you a few rooms, but this was an enormous exhibition that worked counterclockwise with each room named after a letter of the alphabet. So people are traipsing through all these rooms, then they come to room O, then they're spilled out after uh, this kind of the climactic room into the March on Rome, which Mussolini celebrates as his conquering of Rome, even though the parade was really just for show, right? So the rewriting of history here. Then the very last room in the center that uh, the public comes to, and I want to emphasize that millions of people saw this show because it was up for two years. So it's calculated that a tenth of the Italian population had this experience. The last room in the, in the center of uh, the building, a palazzo, it's called the Palazzo de Esposizione, it's still up, it still exists today, is the altar of the martyrs. And in this room, everyone sees those who have sacrificed themselves to the cause of fascism. It had a, uh, a cross with a blood red lighting on it. So neon lighting had already you know, been invented and used in exhibition spaces. It has the word presente over and over again, also in lights and sound effects, saying presente over and over again. So people, after having the experience of the exhibition, then get to have this religious experience together after they've been told to get ready to sacrifice themselves. So the Germans learned a lot from this. Again, Mussolini was in power for over 10 years uh, before Hitler came to power. And when Hitler came to power in 19, early 1933, his propaganda minister went to Italy to visit the exhibition. And Goebbels actually wrote in his diary about how uh, fascism had a very close bond, tight bond with the people, and we should learn from it. And so one of the things that Goebbels learned was the power of these communal spaces to bring people together into a particularly choreographed narrative. So this is the first photo exhibition that the Germans put together, the Nazis put together after Hitler came to power called Die Kamera in late 1933. And here you sort of see they're learning, you know, they learn from the Italians about the usefulness of, of using these enormous blow ups to create spaces, but they had a much more orderly approach to this, right? So the Italian, very kind of dramatic, theatrical, um, kind of overwrought even, the Germans are creating a way for people to come into the space and feel that they're actually at, physically transported to a rally, right? So these are rally images, all taken by Heinrich Hoffmann, who's one of the official photographers um, working with the Nazis. So the rallies are blown up um, to these enormous sizes, just to give you a sense of scale, you know, come in, surrounded by rally photos, being made to feel that they're at the rally, even if they couldn't attend the rally. So you have a kind of echo chamber being created, a very clever echo chamber being created by the Nazis. You've got rallies that are being held so that people can have that experience on the ground. Then they're taking advantage of mass media and new technologies to allow people to experience the rallies even if they weren't at the rally. Then in addition to that, you have film, uh, films like Triumph of the Will being produced and shown in theaters all over Germany so that millions of more people can go witness the rallies and feel like they're at the rallies. So you get you know, obviously much more kind of 
bang for your buck there um, in creating the sensation that this is reality now, these rallies. The exhibition spaces that the Germans continued to create actually emphasized cult of personality um, even more than the Italians. So there's this implication that Hitler is a man of the people because you have this, again, this kind of oceanic mass of people behind him, creating almost a mosaic. And you've got representations of workers and military people, you know, and farmers. But he, I mean, again, this is the goal, okay? So you can sort of imagine the experience that people were having of the image of this man. And then the year after the Deutschland exhibition, this was created for uh, on the occasion of the Olympics. Um, you have Give Me Four Years Time. This is the Hall of Honor um, in the exhibition space. And this is, again, where you can see the Nazis understanding the importance of creating spaces that feel quasi-religious. Um, so I actually have a, a description of this unbelievable space, if you'll just bear with me for a second while I read this. Um, so from the wide side of the courtyard, a huge semicircle, radiant light floods breaking on a seven-step staircase at the foot. It is nine times divided, nine pedestals almost nine meters high, uh, and six meters wide pictures raised up to the ceiling. Uh, images of the elapsed four years. Each of these books contains, consists of six specifically under artistic unique photo documents, illuminated by powerful spotlights of the, at the base and turned over by a hidden mechanism. So the images of Germany's progress under Hitler were actually moving um, in rotation. In precisely measured timing, the headlights light up the giant panels. They begin silently turning under the powerful sounds of symphonic music and manly, virile, poetic words. That's directly from a review at the time. A solemn, unforgettable impression, and also in the history of representation of technology and photography, a remarkable event. Because here was the first time, and having flown to the attempt made to a moving language and accompanied a photo show with music, it has created a completely new style of representational art that combines intensity of photos with the emotional effect of music and poetry, almost like you say, a worldly photo liturgy. So it was described by a reviewer at the time who was seen as, as a religious experience. So after having that religious experience, then people go into the spaces, and this is what they see. Again, this idea that Hitler is one of the people um, with masses behind him, but he is above all the most important. In other words, he equals the state. And I would propose that Mussolini had a similar um, kind of uh, understanding of the importance of presenting himself, even though it was a ruse as a man of the people. He would film himself doing things like going into the wheat fields, threshing wheat, of course, having been brought there by his black limousine and being escorted away in his black limousine. But in the meantime, the documentary film is taken of him threshing wheat with the people. So I would say that sort of two things that really stick out to me is so dangerous about these dictators. One, uh, I mean, many things, but two things that really stick out um, that I try to emphasize in the book. The idea that they're one of the people even though they're clearly not, and to their use of religious imagery. And that may be a place where we can, John and I can cross over a little bit. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, so the first question is going to be for Vanessa. You spoke to this with your examples a bit, but just to reiterate, how did these dictators, Mussolini and Hitler, convince people that these movements were grassroots movements, even though in reality they were orchestrated from the top down? 
Yeah, so just to um, uh, maybe you know, go back to the examples that I gave in the paper, I really think that um, we can't underestimate how important it was that the fascists understood um, that allowing uh, the Italian people to submit their own documents to this exhibition um, would create feelings of nostalgia and sentimentality about their own experiences in World War I uh, that would then lead them to feel that the, the exhibition was for them. And um, that's the, that I think that the Italian example feels like a very kind of strong example for me now, um, and also with an image, I mean, it's, it's relevant to Hitler too, but I think it's particularly um, evocative with Mussolini and the fact that he, you know, made such an attempt to make himself look like he was from the working class um, so that he could appeal to people who felt um, left, uh, left behind by the chaos of war. You know, the idea that he's going to bring order out of the chaos because he understands their plight and he's a man who, he came from a working class background and so he was able to, to sell that um, and, you know, go into the fields and work alongside them and say, like, I understand you and, you know, therefore you come on this journey with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, those are very, very powerful emotions. Very powerful. Yeah. Really powerful. For John, um, both your book and Vanessa's involve using art for the purpose of promoting various forms of top-down hierarchy. In Rorick's case, occult mysticism was central in his attempts to realize that goal. From an academic point of view, what was it like to write about someone whose life was so heavily shaped by belief in the supernatural? And what kind of scholarly challenges did that involve? So, a lot. Uh, so I, I want to impress upon people, uh, if you if you do a quick Google search of Rarick, uh, you will come up uh, you know upon like all kinds of evidence that I mean there are thousands upon thousands of people today who revere Rarick in the way he's trying to present himself here. This is a portrait by his son actually presenting him as the reincarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama, fated to rule Tibet. Now, there are people who believe that Rarick is a guru, a prophet, an ascended master. And they include some of the most powerful gatekeepers to Rarex materials in museums, both in Russia and America and in India. So the first thing is, just to get access to museums and archives, um, you kind of have to convince people that you're not going to be disrespectful to the, the literally the spiritual and religious aspects of Rarick's career. So uh, you know, in Russia, this was a big pain in the neck until recently because in Moscow, the biggest museum dedicated to Rarick uh, literally was like the mother church of a Rarick cult. Uh, now, I will note the government busted this museum in 2017. And on one hand, that was Putin's doing, and I'm like, yay Putin for busting this insanely ridiculous cult, but anything that Putin does is also bad, and there were reasons that this, he, was, he did this for his own personal selfish reasons. Um, and at least I will note in Russia that there's a more secular museum that's taken over uh, really the hundreds of paintings that that former museum had. If you go to New York, um, you know that, that building I showed you? Uh, the collection there is still now housed by a very friendly uh, vaguely spiritual museum uh, that you can visit today right outside Columbia University if you walk south of it, uh, the Rarick Museum there. They're like the Unitarians of the Rarick mm -hmm. movement where they actually were very friendly to me, but I had to do an interview with them saying, well, I don't want to rubbish this guy. I don't believe in his stuff, but I want to approach the, I want to approach, I want to approach the topic, you know, from a scholarly point of view, respectful of the idea that he had spiritual beliefs that I myself don't share. But I had to have an interview with the director of the museum, and I made, I remember making a pitch. If I were writing a biography of Martin Luther or someone else who took a religious view seriously, I wouldn't necessarily feel the need to disprove or prove the spiritual belief. But especially in Russia, this is challenging because um, people who are the, the big wigs in Rarick's studies also believe in him as a spiritual figure. Uh, I will note that I have. Uh, I've been working on Rarick for a good long time now. I've already been branded an enemy of Russian culture. 
uh, by the museum that used to house most of his art. Simply for, along with a couple of other Russian scholars who treat him like a real historical figure and not a spiritual <laughs> saint, for just saying, oh, he did these espionage things. He did these politically dodgy things in the world. And uh, you know, anyone who's kind of questioned the saintliness of his uh, public record has been condemned like that. So that's one challenge. Um, another thing, too, is this is a man who founded his own cult. And he actually, he, 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 he brought together followers um, on the idea that he had a cosmic scheme to sell, that he, that he and his wife were literally channeling masters who were directing the destiny of the world, including the people in New York who funded him, including literally a cabinet mem member of Roosevelt's administration. And one of the questions you have to ask yourself, did the Rarex believe this themselves? or not. I mean, this is a man who's kind of on the same order as L. Ron Hubbard, right, founder of Scientology. And I ended up having to take a lot of inspiration scholarly and journalistically from authors who've written about like cult figures or new age prophets in the modern era. And one of the questions is how do you deal with um, new age or modern cults, which for some people are legitimate modes of spirituality. Uh, there are plenty of people who actually you know, sincerely believe in or adhere to these belief systems. And for them, this is as valid a form of spirituality as Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, what have you. Um, and how do you deal with that respectfully, even if you don't share the beliefs, and even, even if you think the founders of these groups might or might not be fraudulent? I'll note that in my case, I believe the Rarics were sincere. They did believe this. Uh, they did actually believe they were in touch with spirits. I've read enough of their diaries. I've read enough of their internal papers and their private letters among themselves to think, for whatever reason, you know, uh, delusion, hyperactive imaginations. There are a lot of psychological, uh, there's a lot of psychological research done into the mindset of cult leaders. Um, L. Ron Hubbard has got a lot of scholarship devoted to himself right there in that question. I believe they were sincere. I don't share their beliefs, but I believe at least they weren't purposefully deluding people. They were deluding themselves along with the people they brought along with the same. But that's a really hard thing to kind of piece out. Because I don't know, there are a lot of people, many Western art historians don't like Rarig, and this is one of the reasons that the biography of him has never been written, because I will note art historians, of which I am not one, have been kind of grateful that a historian has taken on this subject, <laughs> because <laughs> no one wants to deal with the new age freak who might or might not have been a complete fraud. And I can't say with 100% accuracy that Rarig was not a fraud. I don't believe he was. I believe he was self-deluded. I mean, just look at the painting. <laughs> but in any case, um, that's a challenge. Also, I have read reams and reams of material, like full of all kinds of prose. We have like their diaries, his wife's diaries. These are all recordings from seances. And they're full of language like literally, the eagle flies at dawn, the warriors of virtue uh, ride across the horizon with the spears of virtue to realize the goals of destiny. OK, <laughs> and that means what exactly? Uh, with a lot of artists who dabbled in the occult, if we were talking about Kandinsky or Mondrian or other people who you know, fell into this, you could deal with their occult interest in a metaphorical, abstract ways. The problem is, we, for the Rarics, the occult was the guide to everything they did. So decoding what they wanted to do in real life, whether it was conquering a state in Asia or going grocery shopping, and I'm not kidding, it's all in that language. You know, um, you know, the hawk of destiny flies at midnight. That means pick up some bread at the local grocery. I mean, so that kind of thing is also challenging. And I will say, you, you can you get very, very uh, tangled uh, in this kind of scholarship if you're not careful. You have to kind of put up some rigid barriers between you and the subject. Also, I will note, luckily, uh, I have a full beard now here. I used to have just a goatee, and when I started losing my hair, I had Russians point out, oh, you look just like Rarick. Are you trying to be like him? <laughs> and that was not so cool. And one other kind of weirdo thing that I will contend with, same thing, actually. I will say, when Rarick traveled in America, a lot of people kind of juxtaposed, Rarick looks like a anti-communist Lenin, and I look like both, so I grew the beard instead of the goatee. Uh, I will note, there's also, if you Google my last name and Rarick, uh, and this is like one of these unfortunate coincidences I will sure be dealing with for the next number of years, there is another McCammon, 
totally unrelated to me. I've never met this woman who's a new age author who actually writes about him as a guru and a prophet. I'm like, oh my God. You know, you know like, like Humphrey Bogart, of all the gin joints in all the world, of all the last names in all the world, you, new age freak, had to have my name. Uh, of course, now when she discovers this video online, if she ever does a search, she's going to see me rubbishing her, but I'm sorry. That's just the way things are. So, because I will know, the first thing I get when I go to a scholarly conference, you study Rarick, you're not one of them, are you? And, In the cult? Yeah. And that's, that's the first thing that people ask. And so actually just actually establishing that I'm a scholar working on this subject from an academic point of view, you would think that should just go without saying. But unfortunately with Rarick, it does not. So that's one of those challenges as well. Um, so you, so we, so I'm sorry, we have, we're running close yeah, yeah, yeah. to the end. And I had a third question, yeah, but yeah, I'm pretty sure you something. guys answered yeah. the question. Yeah. So why don't, well, oh, it, that yeah. yeah, so I mean, at the end of it, it was to what degree does this mm -hmm. sort of <coughs> manipulation to continue to pose political and social dangers today? Um, you kind of talked about it, but because of the interest of time, let's have our audience pose questions. If, I, if I could just, uh, just add one quick thing sure. um, to, to that question. Um, another, just another uh, sort of quote about the experience that people had in these uh, exhibition spaces, you know, in, in the Nazi regime. These, again, are direct quotes about people coming in to the camera with the huge blow-ups, and thousands of visitors enter every hour, stand before the documents of the growth of the movement, images described as colossal, and before they realize it, fall into silent devotion. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there's just um, kind of consistent religious overtones to the experiences that people are having in, this, in these spaces. And I think we just have to remember how dangerous that is because if people become convinced that it's a religion, there is going to be no persuading them to have any critical distance mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. those political movements. And I do think that's a problem that we have to talk about today as well. Absolutely. You know, the intertwining yeah. of politics and religion. And yeah. how seductive that is. Yeah. And I'll just note yeah. that Rarick in the post Soviet period has been kind of. This is a man who was a peace activist on one hand, talked about you know the love of humanity and the breaking down of barriers. But he was also such a Russophile that there have been bad actors in Russia. And for a while, Putin was one of them until he like just glommed onto the Orthodox Church instead, using some of Rarick's rhetoric as a way of kind of promoting this very xenophobic, Russophile view of the world that Russia is destined to rule Eurasia and using this kind of like quasi-mystical sense of Russia as a country of destiny in some very politically unpleasant ways that I don't think that Rarick himself would have approved of, but sometimes you lose control of your own message right. when you're dead. So, all right. So I'm sure it hasn't been lost to the audience that there's a very prescient nature to what our panelists have just shared with us about their books. And now we'll open it up to you. Um, Anyone want to go first with a question? Yeah. I just wanted to ask Rocco about the uh, <laughs> comparison between Mussolini and Hitler, and which, which one do you think persuaded their citizens better to follow their ideology? That's an interesting question. Well, so what I think ended up happening is that Mussolini, um, oh yeah, sorry. Mussolini um, created a template for Hitler. So, you know, uh, I think that Hitler had a, had an opportunity, and Goebbels, the propaganda minister, um, always have to remember him, had a chance to study the ways in which Mussolini was able, in particular, to use mass media uh, in order to embed this cult of personality to every corner of the country. Um, and then, uh, you know, Goebbels was able to actually build on that and, and I think, create a machine of cult of personality around Hitler that ended up outdoing what Mussolini was able to do. So, um, so yeah, one essentially, you know, was created the model for the next one. And that's another one of those sort of, tra you know, tragedies of the 1930s that uh, people don't, you know, s make the connections between the two, you know, because it was it was not inevitable that Hitler would be as successful as he was at creating this cult of personality. It happened in the early to mid 30s, 
you know, well before the war broke out. Yeah. When you showed the first couple of slides of the Italian exhibit, yeah. I was struck by how chaotic it looked. Yeah. Like visually, it's really hard to even figure out what you're looking at in terms of walls and, and <coughs> corners. And, and from an art historical perspective, it reminds me of Kurt Schwitters. It reminds me of like... The words, the mirror's yeah, bad. It reminds me of collecting random yeah. garbage from the street like he did and like putting it all together in this weird way. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Looking at the slide, I feel like I can't even figure out what I'm looking at, really. Yeah. As compared to, as you, as you pointed out, the Nazis, which were so much more rational and clear. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's very true that uh, one of the other lessons that the Nazis seemed to learn from the Italians was, okay, we're going to take these spectacles, uh, but we are, we're going to make them much more sort of seamless, streamlined experiences. The Italians, um, now, however, though, you know, I don't think we can kind of discount the way, let's see if I can get back to one of my images, that they were creating personal experiences for people with, um, you know, some of these niches. Like, this is something I didn't include um, in the show, but this is, this is one area of that you know, extravagant room O, one little niche where there is this, uh, there was this event where the socialist newspaper was burnt down by fascists and the fascists made this into a cause uh, for celebration. And so there, you know, there's images of, documentary images of the fire and then these kind of ridiculous like metallic flames that they've created. But then as you get closer into the niche, also the sloganeering about how great it was that we got rid of these you know, dirty socialists is hovering over your head. So you know, it's, it's allowing people to have these very emotional experiences, which I think was, actually, was effective in its own way, but very different than the, the rationalization that the Germans were after in their spaces. So. Ex except for more, except for more people wanted Alfa Romeo. <laughs> oh, here we have. Let's see. Um, I wanted to ask how much do you think that Mussolini was bad, or is bad to us in terms of the in terms of the template he practically invited? Uh, in terms of like nowadays leaders or dictators such as Lukashenko or. or could say Putin, how much do you yeah. think that they follow the template, like his template? Uh, if they, if yeah. they actually do. Absolutely. I think that, um, I think that Putin um, is very aware of the power of images like this, of implying, you know, that you're a man of the people, but then also being able to combine stuff like this with the more, uh, kind of cult of personality images like Mussolini speaking from the balcony to these rallies and taking his shirt off, you know? Just which, like Putin. Just like Putin. This kind of, you know, insistence on always presenting uh, masculinity in this very aggressive way. Um, I don't think there's there's any doubt that Mussolini is continuing to, to provide, you know, an example for both dictators and wannabe dictators, even in recent um, Italian history, like Berlusconi, who was thought to ha you know, be desirous of, of Mussolini-esque both persona and power. So yeah, I mean, it re this re reverberates on to the present day. Yeah, if I can add, I mean, those of you who are in my modern Europe class have heard me harp on about the fact that actually Mussolini, I think, is the more uh, widely imitated uh, fascist leader from the past than Hitler. I mean, you know, you can't really get away easily with imitating Hitler today, but you can use Mussolini's playbook, which, as Vanessa points out, came first and Hitler imitated. But I think you're absolutely right. You can safely get away with a lot of the Mussolini playbook. I will say a certain orange-haired president did a pretty good job of that recently here. Uh, without crossing certain boundaries uh, in a way that you cannot be obviously 
Nazi. So I, 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 as much as we kind of tend to like look down at Mussolini as like what the, 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 the kind of the, the goofball second partner to Hitler, I think he actually put into place a template that's a lot more politically influential today yeah. uh, than Hitler's. I mean, and initially when their partnership started, Mussolini had no doubt that he was going to be an equal, if not the dominant partner. Well, he was the OG, right? Uh, yeah. um, and, you know, he was quickly disabused of that notion um, once, you know, once the war started in particular. Yeah, but, but that's a very good, I think that's a very astute point. Vanessa, how much do you think Albert Speer and Lenny Riefenstahl actually bought into the whole um, Goebbels Nazi um, spiel, or were they really just um, careerists, that they just saw this as a way to elevate themselves to, you know, to, fur to further their career? And I just, you know, think that both of them were really brilliant. And how, and I just don't, intellectuals, I don't see how, I mean, my, my feeling is that they didn't really buy into it, but they saw it as a way to get work. So Harry's uh, asking about the director of this film, Tribe of the Will, um, who famously tried to excuse herself um, from, this is something I've also talked with my current classes about, um, in our class's Images of Persuasion, but tried to excuse herself uh, from responsibility um, of Nazi actions by implying that she was just a documentarian, she was just setting up the cameras, you know, she was just a fly on the wall, recording what was there. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't buy it, because she, you know, aggressively edited these films in ways that, aggrandized Hitler um, at a very kind of crucial moment, you know, in 34, 35, and, um, you know, elevated him in her film as much as possible, including that quasi-religious opening of Triumph of the Will where he's flying in an airplane down from the clouds. She made those decisions, so, um, those editorial decisions. So I, I think that she, it is fair to hold her responsible for the power of this propaganda and what it did to the public. So Spear was brought to Nuremberg. Did you ever talk to Nuremberg? Trial? No. No. She and she and she lived to be, you know, she lived to be a hundred and one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and spent that entire time attempting to to rehabilitate her image, but I don't she was never um, I think thankfully she was never completely successful at doing that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Speer played a much active role in the regime as an actor militarily and politically, not just as an artistic figure. So yeah, yeah, it made more sense that he was at Nuremberg, and again, I will say quite justifiably, whatever his battle gap about it later on. Yeah. But it's an important question. Yeah. So we, we, need to, <laughs> we need to conclude. And before we do, I just want to give these two a round of applause.
their heart and soul to be in your seat and have the opportunity to listen to people like this. So take that with you. It's a grain of salt, but you know I think it's important to remember that and be grateful that we have that. Thank you so much, and thanks to the for everyone showing up. We know that it's a very busy time of year, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank everybody. you. Yeah, y'all have a good night. Yes, I'll talk to you. <laughs> and uh, don't. Uh,